Welcome to Melomania Chatcast. I'm Andrew Cady, a musician and producer, and each time I talk to a musical colleague about how they do music. This time we have Melanie Rothman, a classical oboist from the UK who studied at some of Europe's most renowned conservatoires in London, Paris, Salzburg and Stuttgart. Melanie has won several oboe prizes and is currently a member of the Bavarian State Radio Symphony Orchestra in Munich. She guests as principal oboist all over Europe, including at the CBSO in Birmingham. Aside from this deep commitment to classical oboe playing, Melanie has a keen interest in folk music and bagpipes. And this is how we met a few years back. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. So just to start us off, a really easy question, well, easy for me to ask anyway. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe an oboe to someone who has never seen or heard one before? Um, I would describe it as something that's similar to the clarinet, but sounds very different. So a uh, woodwind instrument made out of African blackwood with lots of metal keys on and with a double reed in the top that actually creates the sound. Yeah. yeah. So how would you describe the sound that it makes? Um, sweet, singing, reedy. Yeah. And quite loud, as I've just discovered. Louder than <laughs> I expected. <laughs> well, depends on the player. <laughs> yeah. And, and what, in your opinion, can the oboe do best? Mm, I think the oboe is great with um, expressiveness. So actually a lot of the um, orchestral repertoire, the oboe has many solos that kind of plaintive or sort of for romantic scenes in operas that kind of thing yeah. that's that's really its strength yeah mm. yeah what's the most famous oboe piece someone who wasn't in classical into classical music would maybe recognize uh probably the theme from swan lake by tchaikovsky So d double reed instruments include bagpipes, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but you play mostly classical music. So mm -hmm. was classical music around in the house as you were growing up? Or how did that? No. No, not really. That, no. That's probably quite unusual, is it? Yeah, so I, I don't come from a musical family. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are musical people in my family, but they didn't grow up learning classical music or yeah. taking violin lessons or anything like that. Um, so I kind of took to it quite late. I was about 10 or 11 years old. Um, my parents had just moved me into another school. And I was one of the only girls, so it was a girls' school, who didn't play an instrument or couldn't read music. So, And I, I don't like feeling like I'm behind everyone else. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll have to choose an instrument and have a go at that. Um, but typically for me, I didn't want to play what everyone else played. So I picked the one that nobody played or only one person played. Um, and that's how I came to the oboe. So I actually had very little knowledge about what it entailed. So it wasn't necessarily the instrument itself either. Was it something that you grew to love or did you instantly connect with it as, as a sound as well? Um, I think I did connect with it pretty immediately, yeah, once I started playing, but it was more wanting to be involved in music than anything else. Yeah. Committing to classical music as a, as a job, which you obviously mm -hmm. at some age decided you were going to do, is a, is a, is a big and um, intense journey. Yeah. What age were you when you decided this is what you wanted to do? And how would you say that journey differs from musicians in other genres like rock and pop, jazz or folk? Um, I think I decided to do so probably already by the age of 12. So I think mm. within a year of playing, I already decided that that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, I think mostly because I really enjoyed it, but also because I was good at it. And I felt like, okay, this is my, I don't know if I'd say this was my calling, but this is the thing that felt right to me. Um, and I think the difference for the journey for classical musicians is perhaps that you have to start really early because so much of it is focused on how virtuosic you are on your instrument, how well you play. Um, 
you know, classical musicians study for a very long time, even when they've started her playing professionally or have jobs, they still mm. study yeah. because music is one of those things that, you know, you never stop in terms of interpretation, in terms of developing your technique. Um, and because a lot of the instruments are just so hard to master, like the violin, then you just have to start really early and commit yourself to it and say, okay, every day I've got to play three, four hours of practice every day. And that's what you just have to stick to. Um, so it's a really, really big commitment to make early on. So you have to be really sure about it because it's also just a hard path to take. Yeah, it's not something you can just dabble in, is it? You either, you're either doing it or you're not. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> if it's your job, yeah. 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 But so that would mean that you didn't know you wanted to be a professional musician before you started learning the oboe. It's something you realized within a year of starting up, yeah. which is probably quite unusual, is it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I was probably the only one of the only kids at that age, you know, sort of 12 years old, who knew what they wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, most people don't even know what they want to do when they're at GCSE A levels, you know, they have to decide yeah. which subjects to take so that they can get to university and everybody's racking their brains like, well, what the hell am I going to do at university? Whereas for me, that was already done and dusted. And I'd had so many years of concentrating on the oboe that was kind of no choice, actually. That was at least my feeling. I felt like I was kind of stuck with it. I wanted to be st stuck with it, but... Yeah, I was just about to ask. I think I think I did that. I just made yeah. sure there were no other choices. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, and I'm afraid, everybody, I'm just going to have to be a musician because yeah. I don't know about you, but I was always warned, probably yeah, well-meaningly, mm. musician is a hard, hard job to go into. Yeah. If you want to be a... A professional musician in whatever genre, um, you're going to have to make a lot of sacrifices yeah. and there'll be no job security or very little job mm -hmm. security a lot of the time mm -hmm. and it might not work out and then what are you going to do? What's your plan B? And But I think I secretly quite early worked out it's not a good idea to have a plan B because people who have plan Bs usually end up doing the plan B. Did you? Yeah, I think you, I think you have to have a really high level of conviction in yeah. order to make it work because yeah. it is that hard. And as yeah. I said, it's this massive commitment that you have to make earlier, early on. Yeah, I mean, there have definitely been times where I felt like things weren't going to work out at all, but kept persevering and things have been working better. So um, that's the thing. You just never really know how things are going to turn. I mean, look at the pandemic, you know, that hit especially freelance musicians really, yeah. really terribly. But a lot of those people didn't give up you included so yeah um, no plan b <laughs> <laughs> no plan so you've just started a new job relatively new job at the yeah. bavarian state radio symphony orchestra yeah. what's it like being in such a big band <laughs> and, and and such an important institution worldwide yeah well it's amazing actually because it is my favorite orchestra no joke and yeah. has been my favorite orchestra for many, many years. You know, that's one of the orchestras that you sort of grew up hearing their recordings and going to their concerts because they go on international tours. Um, it is one of the most important orchestras in the world. So for me to be a part of that is really an amazing thing. And it, and it was a dream of mine, has been a dream of mine. And, you know, it's early days. I've just started my job there. Um, but there, you know, I, sometimes I turn up to rehearsal and I actually can't really believe that I'm sitting with those guys and that I'm allowed to be a part of it. But, yeah. you know, I had an audition process to get And you're there. one of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of them. And, um, your, which is crazy really, yeah. really, yeah, crazy, yeah. but also yeah. an amazing feeling. And, yeah. and, and um, to know that I've been able to get to that point as well, you know, that all of, all of the tough stuff I've gone through and the hard work I've done has, you know, has paid off. Um, and that's a... You know, I, d I don't think that it stops there, though. You know, you, you sit with colleagues who have the most incredible level and you have to stay at that level 100% of the time. Yeah. So that's something that I'll never let go of. I mean, I'm also someone that is continuously working, working on myself, making sure I'm getting better. I don't think I'll ever be comfortable and laid back. I think you need to be that kind of personality. Do you think all musicians are like that? I wouldn't say all are. No, <laughs> but I, I certainly think most are most to stick at it and 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 stick at it as a job and a commitment i just can't imagine not trying to improve because uh, mm -hmm. most people i've encountered are, who are really good don't realize how good they are because they they're always thinking of what they don't 
like about their own playing. Yeah. And that's maybe something from the outside you wouldn't necessarily pick up on. Mm. But then they say it and you think, oh, yeah, maybe perhaps. Yeah. And, and I think it takes that to, to keep yourself interested as well and to, to get to a certain level. I think so. And actually there's a, a, an old friend, a mentor of mine, who used to tell me when I was like a teenager, he'd say, as soon as you believe or think that you're good, you're already on the way down. Yeah. And that's something I've never, ever forgot, forgotten. Because yeah. that's true. As soon as you start getting too comfortable, especially with your own playing, then, then things do relax and then you, your standards do slip. So I think, you know, I think it's also okay to, to be comfortable and slip into that yeah. if that's what you want. But um, for me, for example, my, my aim is to, to reach the highest quality possible of music making. Does that mean you never enjoy your own playing then? <laughs> um, <laughs> or is it like a ballot? For, for me, personally, it's I have to try and have a balancing act between, in a performance situation, learning to forget the bits I'm not happy with in yeah. order to enjoy it enough to, to give a good performance. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I enjoy my playing per se, but yeah. I would say I enjoy playing and I yeah. enjoy making music with other people. That's kind of yeah. why I'm there. Um, and of course I enjoy the performances I'm involved in. It's an amazing yeah. feeling. I think I wouldn't keep going back to it um, if it wasn't. And, and for me, the most important thing is, is um, having a sense of bringing something amazing to someone else. You know, you've always got, it doesn't matter if it's two people sitting there in the public or if it's 2,000. Yeah. Um, if you can make a difference to even one person, that's a huge thing, even, whether you know it or not. Yeah. And I think that's that's the thing that brings me back on, and on the sort of a rare occasion that, you know, someone comes up to you and, and says something, oh, that, that was a really emotional performance for me, or even they just said, oh, that was lovely, thank you. Um, that's something that is extremely important for me and I think is another thing that makes me coming back, come back to it. So that, uh, I wouldn't say it makes me feel gratified or something. It's more like, okay, I've, I've managed to do something that's giving to someone else. And at the same time, I've enjoyed, you know, playing a fantastic concert with, with great colleagues. Yeah. So. so what's that like? I mean, my performance experience is, kind of, is not as formal as mm -hmm. a classical concert, I, yeah. I, I think. I've only once or twice done something like that as an exam yeah. at university. So yeah. that the, the performing experience and the way the audience reacts is quite different. It's very, um, the, there's almost like a fourth wall between between the performers and the listeners, as, as I imagine anyway. Yeah. Whereas the, the kind of performance in folk music or, or types of music I've been involved in is is more about speaking to the audience. Mm -hmm. that we do a lot of speaking and, and yeah. try and get reaction whoops or uh, <laughs> you, you know like, or get people to sing with a chorus you don't see that so much in classical music so how do you do, do you think you still get the same feeling while you're playing back from the audience of whether they're enjoying it or not or do you find out at the end when they clap well I mean obviously the way things work with classical concerts generally speaking is a lot less interactive yeah. But I think it's also part of the job of the musician on stage to make that connection. You can't necessarily wait for the audience to come to you or their energy to come to you. It's more like, okay, I'm, I'm presenting this to these people and how can I bring them in? At least that's the way that I feel. And of course, it's obvious at the end of the concert with the way they're clapping or reacting or standing up or whatever, how well it's been received. But I think you do, you do um, receive kind of some kind of energy from them, but it's really something you have to give out there first. It's not just going to come to yeah, you. Yeah, you yeah. do feel it as well. I yeah, think. You do, yeah, yeah, you do. Um, so you've, I've, I read on the website of your orchestra that Sir mm. Simon Rattle is coming to be your your uh, conductor from, from 2023 next, season. next yeah. season. So he's like for people who don't know, he's one of the big star conductors in this world at the moment. Yeah. What's it like to work with someone who? has that kind of rock star status. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, these people are like Sir Simon are just incredible musicians first and foremost. Yeah. Um, when someone like that comes up and stands on the podium, you don't just think, oh, this is a great conductor. That's a great musician. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the big difference for yeah. me, at least. Um, you know, these kind of top conductors, they really even though they're conducting and not playing an instrument, they're making music with you. They're going through the process with you. You don't feel like that person's doing their job and we're doing ours. It's more of, okay, this is a collective thing. You've 
been based in Germany now, also the, another German orchestra before that for, for a couple of years. Um, yeah. um, Rot, Rotman, I introduced <laughs> you as Rothman, but Rotman yeah. is uh, a Germanic name yeah. and uh, you've grown up in, in the UK, but mm -hmm. your family history um, is also connected very strongly to Germany. Yeah, Do you, that's right. Um, It's a tricky question, but I think mm -hmm. an interesting thing to get into also connected to music. So yeah. um, do you want to explain how your family ended up in, in the UK? Uh, yes, yeah, so actually, my, my grandmother was born in Berlin. Mm. Um, her parents, my great grandparents originally came from Poland. They moved over uh, to Berlin for the textile trade. Um, there are a lot of um, Jewish people working the textile trade and Berlin was one of the big centers of that. My great grandfather was um, a farrier, so he was making fur coats, everything with fur. Um, that's what they did in Prenzlauer Berg in Berlin until outbreak of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, my great-grandfather fought as a soldier for Germany in the First World War, but in the Second World War was persecuted because of his faith, because of being Jewish. Yeah. Um, my grandmother and her brother uh, luckily managed to flee. Um, they were given asylum in, in the UK with sort of friends of friends or friends of the family um, in the north of England, first of all. And later um, she moved down to London and made her life there and got married there too. And yeah, I mean, that's how my family ended up in the UK, at least that side of the family. And my grandmother actually made the decision never to go back to Germany again. Um, not because she didn't want to, but because at the time she felt that she wouldn't be welcome again. Okay. Yeah. So did you have any connection to Germany growing up or, or, or of your kind of German heritage in any way? Or is this something you've discovered since, since coming here? Or have you even discovered or felt that? It's something that's come on much later. So we always had family friends in Germany that we'd come to visit when I was a child. So, you know, I got um, familiar in, in particular with sort of Odenwald region and Hessen. And which is interestingly where I ended up living yeah. in Germany when I first moved to Germany. I moved to Frankfurt. Um, And that I think that will always remain a very special area of Germany to me, um, even though now I've moved to Bavaria, so, um, which is another thing entirely. Um, yeah, I think it's something that I had to, I don't want to say come to terms with later on. I've never had a problem with moving to Germany. I've always enjoyed uh, living here. And the musical climate here is frankly amazing. I mean, it's one of the best countries to be in for that. I'm here for a cultural purpose, which is the most powerful thing. Um, against racism, against persecution. Um, I'm very pro-internationalist. <laughs> Being a musician, that's one of the best ways to do that, I think, or the best yeah. symbol of it. Germany is a very different place now. It's a very, very different place now. So. Yeah, I imagine so. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Germany's yeah. done an awful lot, more, more yeah. I think more than any country I'm aware of. Most countries at some point have persecuted someone or other. Yeah. And Germany have been very open and very um, direct about um, stamping that out and, and, yeah. and becoming a, a new and better place in that. Yeah. So I, ho I hope you've, that's been your experience of it. It has yeah. been and yeah. I think that's actually something that attracts me to Germany. I mean, mm -hmm. I came here for, for music, um, but that has been something that's been really impressive to me actually, um, the way yeah. that that's been approached. and. And what, what about German colleagues, German musicians? Mm -hmm. Are they, is that a funny thing for them, an odd thing for them to come to terms with? Or is it just never talked about or mentioned? Um, I haven't really spoken to many people about it, but mm. I think that it's, it, it's so part of the psyche now yeah. that people don't even think twice about it. That's the way which is how it should be yeah <laughs> <laughs> so sorry to sorry yeah. to even bring it up but i i just thought important to bring yeah up. yeah but that's obviously there's some um there must be some emotion attached to that and that's why yeah. i brought it up because yeah. music is a very emotional thing if, you, if you're doing it right then then the, yeah. there should be emotion being transported and it, it's got to come from somewhere so yeah. i i wonder whether deep down somewhere that is something you're channeling channeling when you're playing the oboe I think so, and I think it's a lot to do with what we're playing as well. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if, I don't know, um, we're playing something by Gustav Mahler, who was, you know, a famous Jewish composer, yeah. that's something that's always, I guess, on some level more emotional for me without me being able to explain it. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, 
you know, Wagner was, his music was used um, by a certain nationalist party in the yeah. 1930s and 40s to represent them. And mm. that wasn't a choice of Richard Wagner. He did, however, follow anti-Semitic um, uh, ideas yeah. in his lifetime. At the end, music is music. And as I said before, I think it's the most powerful way to turn uh, poison into medicine. So I don't think it matters really where the music comes from. If it's powerful music, that should be enough. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a big discussion in all types of music yeah. as well, especially with a lot of um, rock stars from the past who've turned out to have been dodgy characters, in, <laughs> or very dodgy characters. Is it okay to listen to, yeah. enjoy, or perform their music? And yeah, yeah, I think that's true, a... Yeah. No, it's difficult. It's, it's a difficult <laughs> yeah. thing. So talking of musical identity, mm. well, how... Is it something? Is your musical identity something you could put into words, <laughs> or is it something you've thought about in that sense, or is it something that you just have? Oh, that's a very difficult question to answer. I don't think I've ever consciously sat down and thought about what is my yeah. musical identity. No, I don't think so. I think that's something that has developed over time for me. I mean, having been someone who grew up in the UK, moved to France when I was nineteen, then to Austria, then to Germany. I've been all over the place. <laughs> um, I already, as a person, find it difficult to say I'm British because in many ways I don't feel like I am anymore. I feel like I'm more of a European. I feel like I've taken on so many influences in my life from the places I've lived in and the people who've surrounded me and the languages I've been speaking and the cultures that come with it. Um, the same thing goes with the oboe and the way I've learned music. I've studied in several different yeah. countries and I think those influence, they just... They just infiltrate into who you are, basically. So I think it's never been something I've really thought about, but it must be a question of having been influenced by many different people, peoples. <laughs> yeah. So is there a different way of playing the oboe in Britain to in France or Austria or Germany? Yes. So um, less so now than 50 years ago. I mean, mm. 50 years ago, there were very distinct schools of oboe from the UK, from Poland, from Germany, from France. Um, that is not really the case anymore. It's a lot more mixed, but I still hear things or um, sort of remnants of the old schools, if you like, or the traditions they have, which yeah. mean that X country has... Uh, a very high level, I'm generalizing here, of technique, or the other one has, X country has, you know, a darker sound, those kind of things. Those, that's being lost over time. Some people find that to be a shame, that these mm. distinct schools are losing their characteristics. Um, other people find it that it's a very positive thing, that things are mixing more. It actually makes it easier to, to tour and, and be guest in an orchestra in France mm. and then Italy or wherever yeah. else. I mean, I do still hear, for example, especially with the UK, actually, I hear with the oboe playing quite a big difference. I think that's partly because it's an island. Okay. Obviously. So is it like an accent you can hear? Is it like <laughs> when, bit, when people yeah. speak and they have a different accent if they're from a different yeah, place? And I think, yeah, and yeah. then with some people yeah. it's stronger than with others. And, yeah. you know, like with me, it depends where people studied or who their influences are or who they've decided. Um, are more of an influence and want to take more of the sound of somebody or, you yeah. know, it's, I think that's a lot of personal choice. And has that opened up more recently because of media, because oh, yeah. of radio and recordings and, and now internet and stuff like that? Absolutely. Like and I'm, in yeah. all kinds of music, I suppose. I'm sure yeah. that's a reason why yeah. we now have this more of a mixing um, kind of stylistically within Europe with we're playing yeah. um, and with probably with most other classical orchestral instruments as well, I would assume that it's mm -hmm. something similar, yeah. So how do you find your own voice in instrumental music that's been composed by people you've probably in most cases never met? Mm -hmm. um, is, is it something you even strive to do to, to play with your, with your own voice? And if so, how did you get to a position to being able to do that? Well, a big part of being a musician, I think, is not only respecting what the composer wanted or would have wanted or what we believe that they would have wanted and the text, but also being able to mix your identity and your ideas and your interpretation into that. Um, so you always have to find the right balance. 
Um, and I think that's something that really comes with uh, musical maturity. And I think that's something that never really stops. And was that something that you were taught to do actively in conservatoires? Mm, so, sort of in earlier studies, you're more taught about stylistic things. You know, this is usually done this way and this is usually done this way. And yeah, there's a bit of wiggle room here and there. But yeah. um, other than that, it's you're kind of on your own, actually. Um, that's part of why it's difficult to be successful as a classical musician, because you have fantastic teachers, but they can't teach you everything. That's interesting. I, I wasn't expecting that answer, mm. actually, because uh, I studied folk music and um, it was quite focused on looking for an individual voice. Maybe they were just nervous about being labelled a factory for folk musicians and everyone sounds okay. the same. Mm -hmm. I don't know the reason, but um, but it was very focused on on looking for our own voice on, on our instruments. And when we arrived there, I don't think all of us really understood what they meant by that even, because we just thought, yeah. just want to play tunes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? What are you on about? Yeah. And, and, and that's something that we, we slowly began to just explore. Oh. Can't even fully remember how, how they made us think about that. Well, that's interesting for me as well, because yeah. actually in our studies, especially for instruments that are, you know, in the direction of having an orchestra career, um, which most, I think most people who go to conservatories do, who play sort of orchestral instruments, not everyone, of course, but a lot of them are aiming to get a job in an orchestra. So a lot of it is about precision, about how to win an audition, about what needs to be you know, in the right place and what kind of uh, vibrato would you use here that it's appropriate for the composer or the epoch or these kind of things. Of course, mm. you, as I said before, you then build your own interpretation into that, but there are already quite a lot of strict rules. So it's, I'd say first and foremost, it's about that. And, yeah. and then the rest, you're kind of on your own. So would it be a different or is that a decision you would make while you're studying whether you want to be a soloist or not and you have to learn different stuff if you want to get into solo playing instead of or as well of as well as playing in an orchestra well everybody plays solo repertoire whilst they're learning the instruments and studying yeah. because they're required for auditions they're required for almost all contexts yeah. making the decision to be a soloist now that's difficult because only a tiny 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 percentage of people will become soloists and generally speaking those people will be picked out at a very young age or they go on to win a big international competition of high importance and then through that they become soloists um having said that even for oboe players who've won uh, first prize in a big international competition that just cannot guarantee you a solo career in most cases because we don't as oboists for example we don't have enough repertoire um to to basically stand on your own two feet just as a soloist that there's hardly anyone who's done that um that's, that's in, interesting yeah, yeah. So, so, it's, so it's definitely an ensemble instrument then um, absolutely yeah. i mean that's just part of the history and the, the way things are of course, you can branch out and find other things that you can do um, with the oboe. You don't have to follow an orchestral career, you, you or you know. But yeah. but if you're playing the piano or the cello or the violin, there's just so much solo repertoire. You could become a soloist if you're successful enough, or you make it happen. It's absolutely yeah. possible. But with some instruments like the oboe or the bassoon or even percussion instruments, that's much more difficult to do. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is in the case of the oboe? Is it because of how strenuous it is to play the instrument for a length of time? I don't think so. I think, um, I think it's just part of the history of the instrument. You know, the oboe sort of uh, came to be in the second half of the 17th century in France um, and started out in sort of oboe bands in Versailles, that kind of thing. Mm. So it was always an instrument that was in a collective. So when I look at an oboe, <laughs> to me, it looks like part of a bagpipe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like if you pull the chanter off a bagpipe, that's, for, for me, it looks a bit like an oboe. So yeah. bagpipes, in your case, how did that happen? Um, <laughs> quite a convoluted um, story. Yeah. Um, Basically, um, I used to play um, period instruments, so Baroque oboes are copies of Baroque and classical oboes. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was studying those at the same time as studying the modern oboe and was getting fairly serious on it. Um, but the technique that's required to play the historical oboes very well and the modern oboe very well is quite different. So you kind of have to choose. Um, and then my body kind of chose for me. I um, started getting tendonitis and it soon became clear that it was coming from the historical instruments. And a lot of people were surprised by that because they say, hey, but they're a lot lighter. There are less mm -hmm. keys on them. Why is that a problem? It just happened to be that the the sort of stretch I had to do with my hand was straining my arm. And yeah, so I actually gave up um, Baroque instruments and at that point completely concentrated on just the modern oboe and following that route, which I think was the right thing. Um, not that I had much of a choice. To be <laughs> and then when I did give up playing um, historical music on historical instruments, I really, really missed it. And I was sort of digging around and reading stuff and listening to things and discovered the Baroque Musette, um, which was a 17th and early 18th century bagpipe played by a lot of the aristocracy of Versailles. Again, Versailles, <laughs> going back there. Um, France. So, you know, similar place to where the oboe started. Um, you know, there are all these... Um, paintings by people like Lancre, I think, was, you know, these um, aristocracy from Versailles uh, dancing around in gardens and there's someone playing a musette. It's, you know, it's not a scene of of um, normal people um, Doesn't in the sound village. very folky, yeah. No, it isn't, but it's pretending to be folky. <laughs> right. Um, and so I, I was got really interested in the musette and thought, actually, I think I could play that without injuring my arm. And I think I would enjoy that. And it's, you know, sort of similar-ish to the oboe, but not really. You know, it's playing different kind of music. So mu musette, do you pump the air into it? Yeah, like you use bellows, of, So yeah. it's like the, the Northumbrian pipe. I think they're even related, aren't they, the Northumbrian pipes? They're kind of musets? cousins in yeah, a way. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I discovered the Northumbrian pipes. When I was reading up about the musette, I read up about this thing called the Northumbrian small pipes that had a very very similar sort of instrumental technique with the closed fingering with the use of the bellows I thought okay I need to hear this thing um when on YouTube the first video that came up was um a video of our friend Andy May hey. <laughs> good, <laughs> hey, good place to start yeah. <laughs> good place to start I think it was Wild Hills of Wanny or something like that you know really traditional Northumbrian tune and I mm -hmm. thought Wow, isn't that amazing sound? I, I never knew that a bagpipe could sound that nice. It's a word, it's a, you know, bagpipes. I love all kinds of bagpipes, but <laughs> nice isn't a word you would use to describe <laughs> any of More the other types, most of the other types. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. that's, that's the thing that's unique about the North Armenian small pipes is so sweet and expressive, but also, you know, you can get all that staccato and there's just... Yeah there's so much complexity in it actually um mm. at least i find there is there's so much more possibility there than i think there is in a lot of the other bagpipes yeah well let's not yeah. get get into it <laughs> no, but i guess that's what drew me to it and i thought yeah. i thought okay that is an amazing instrument i'd always kind of been interested in folk music i just never had a reason to do it Right, so you, you had, that, I was going to ask you that anyway, yeah. you, you had listened to yeah. to folk music before. Yeah. And is that an unusual thing for a classical musician to listen to other types of music? No, no. no. I mean, yeah, any other answer would have really surprised <laughs> me. <but laughs> no, I'd say yeah. that, that all, almost all classical musicians, 99.9% .9 listen to tons of other things as well. Yeah. I think... Um, Maybe this is not what people think about us, but we are very, very open and quite normal, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But do you've you've actually taken the step to learn a different type of music? Yeah. Is that unusual, or is, does does a lot of that go on as well? Um, I don't think it's unusual when you're younger. I mean, mm. if I grew up in Northumberland or an area of the UK where there were people around me playing that kind of music or those kind of instruments, I think it would have been pretty normal probably for me mm. to learn a classical instrument and maybe a folk instrument. But I didn't grow up with any of that around me and I discovered it much later when I was already 
while I was studying, but also working professionally already on the oboe when I started the pipes. So at that stage, yeah, maybe that is more unusual when I've dedicated so much of my time to a completely different type of music, I think, because it takes up so much of your time in your life. Yeah. You just think, oh, goodness, you know, if I if I do this with another kind of music or take up a new instrument, I'm going to have to invest all that time for that as well. And that is a constant battle for me is, um, you know, I have to keep my level with the oboe and working all the time. Um, how do I make time uh, for the pipes and for folk music so that I can keep a level with that as well? And it is a struggle. Yeah, it's interesting and good to hear you say it in that way because I've mm -hmm. with the violin you can you can do both. It's yeah. it's a folk instrument, but probably best known as a as a classical instrument. Yeah. And I know people who've grown up playing both parallel. Mm -hmm. People from Northumberland, for example, yeah. um, I didn't. I um, I, I haven't really learned classical music. Uh, so one of the reasons I'm sort of fascinated to ask these questions and get some in, inside knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but I have been been approached by classical violinists mm -hmm. who want to learn folk music, maybe right. in two lessons, because they think, well, I can do everything already anyway, mm -hmm. and all I have to do is learn the ornamentations, which will take a couple of days, and then I'll be able to do it. Yeah. Then they quickly realize that wasn't the case. Yeah. Did Is that what you were expecting, or, or did you kind of already guess that there was maybe a bit more to it than perhaps first meets the eye? Well, I was, you know, when I started playing... Northumbria music it was with a totally new instrument mm. that you know it is a double reed instrument but the way you play the Northumbrian pipes has absolutely zero to do with the oboe I mean the only similarity is that it has a pipe and a reed in it but that's yeah. it in terms of playing the thing it was really the most disorientating thing and I was learning on my own you know far away from any other Northumbrian pipers I was in the middle of Austria you know <laughs> <laughs> so no I didn't have that feeling of oh yeah it's just you know a music that's a little bit different and I'll master that quickly not at all because I had this beast I had to <laughs> had to try and get it's a bit of a beast isn't yeah, it I... <laughs> sort of you're pumping the air in with your right elbow and then regulating the the pressure with your left elbow mm -hmm. and at the same time you're using those very same arms yeah. so your, your angles changing all the time with the wrists and the fingers yeah. I, I, I find that also a very hard thing yeah. to, and the to thing, get around. The, yeah, and the other thing yeah. that's really hard for me, especially with the North Armenian pipes, is that you have this closed finger system. So because the chanter, the melody part of the instrument, is has a closed end, so no hole on the end, that means that when you have all your fingers down, no sound comes from it. So you lift one, put it back down, lift one, put it back down, um, in order to get the scale. And that felt so alien to me because it is the opposite of most other wind instruments. Yeah. The recorder, the flute, the saxophone, the oboe, the clarinet. You lift your fingers and the more you lift at a time, the higher the, the register goes, more or less. Um, the Northumbrian Pipes was like, it took me about <laughs> a week to like, you know, play a scale, like yeah. really, really slowly because it was just the weirdest feeling. And as soon as the finger sl slips off slightly, the whole thing just squeals. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know why. You're off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was yeah. really, I, you know, that was, I really felt like a complete beginner. Yeah. completely it wasn't like oh yeah i'm picking up another wind instrument i'll you know i'll learn the fingerings in a couple of days no no yeah, yeah. it took me weeks to squeeze out a really simple tune yeah i'm actually quite glad to hear that <laughs> <laughs> so what about oboe in folk music well while we're on yeah. the the subject of folk music um there's not it's not really thought of as a folk instrument i don't know if it ever has been i've seen not officially no no i've seen people use them not very often. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, I mean, there aren't very many people who've done that. Um, obvious people would be Paul Sartin, of course, um, or I think Julie Fowlis was an oboist, and I think oh, she I she yeah. did record some of her songs with the oboe, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen her play in a gig with it. Um, so maybe that's something she just decided not to do later. I don't know. Um, but it's very rare and it's it's funny because if I ever play folk music with people in a session, I whip the oboe out and play a couple of tunes, people always remark to me and how good it sounds and how yeah. well it fits in. And then it's kind of surprising, like, okay, why 
how, why hasn't that been a thing? I guess, again, it's like a history thing, right? You know, you've mm. got the sort of typical Irish uh, instruments and then you've got your Northumbrian pipes and you've got your Scottish small pipes and it's just sort of what was there. And, and Yeah, I think it's generally availability of instruments yeah. that, that obviously just weren't floating around because people would just take whatever was available and, yeah. and make music with that. So yeah. maybe they were just not as obtainable. Yeah, and I guess it's sort of similar with, you know, the history of jazz, you know, with yeah. New Orleans, they mm. had saxes and trumpets lying around and drum kits. And that's how that music developed, because of what was there. And I guess the oboes were not lying around there. <laughs> you know? um, Seemingly not, yeah. Yeah, and I guess, you know, as I said before, it has this very specific tradition and history of being in orchestras and you know, in the 17th century oboe bands. So um, it's just kind of stayed in its domain, um, which is a bit of a shame. And I think maybe because it's stayed in its domain so much and hasn't branched out, maybe that's another reason why it's never become a soloistic instrument. Because as you said, with the fiddle and the violin, that's an instrument you can play classical music or folk music or jazz or anything you want, basically, yeah. and has been used in all of those contexts. And that inspires composers to write um, yeah. solos of, of different styles for the instrument and that hasn't really happened with the oboe so maybe that is part of the reason why there's less repertoire could be uh, yeah yeah know. things like shadas or you yeah. know, some of the famous Lots famous solo, Hungarian solo Romanian pieces. traditional yeah, yeah, there's, things and yeah there's all these traditions that yeah. feed into the classical yeah. tradition and come back out again yeah yeah, yeah, so I, I can understand. Yeah, so you, you need to start. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, start I think, an oboe um, folk tradition. Well, I think Paul Sartin did a brilliant job of that. Yeah, I mean, he yeah. is, he is, he was, you know, the folk oboist, at least for me anyway. Um, and there's a big hole now. He's yeah, there. yeah, he unfortunately died fairly recently. And you were, you were good friends, I think. Yeah, I was good you, friends yeah, with Paul. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, big, yeah. big loss to many, many people. Yeah, he was a, a lovely guy. I only met him once, mm. but um, just if, like everybody who ever met him just always yeah. says, what a lovely guy. Yeah, yeah and what an impressive yeah. musician. Indeed. So, um, oboe in folk music. Is there any other kinds of music where oboes made me some inroads? You don't really hear it in rock and pop very often. Well, um, I mean, there has there have been some famous songs that have had an oboe used in them. Yeah. Um, I know that Roxy Music in the 70s, they used the oboe quite a bit because one right. of their band members played. Um, uh, what's the song by Rod Stewart? This Handbags and Glad Rags or whatever yeah, it's called. That's, that's got an oboe in. I think there was also a Sonny and Cher song. I've got you, babe, has oboe in. Do, 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 yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. And also yeah. Jennifer Juniper by Donovan, Donovan has yeah. an oboe. So there are, you know, some... Good point, some actually, really, when you think about it. Yeah. There, there are some really famous tunes yeah. that have an oboe Twist in. in My Sobriety. Yeah, to, that's to, true. To, to come, yeah. But I think they were literally just kind of, you know, brought in because whoever the songwriters were thought, oh, that'd be a great colour yeah. to have. Um, but, you know, it's not a sort of standard thing that you'd find in a pop band. Yeah, we need to branch out a bit more. Yeah. But it's, it, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy to branch out and start a new thing. Um, a lot of people have asked me if if oboe is played in klezmer because it sounds like an instrument that would work well in klezmer. But again, is not really a fixed yeah. thing in klezmer. And clarinet, clarinet is. More yeah, thing. yeah. So classical musicians, professional classical musicians are sort of held, held up as um, per perfection in music. <laughs> Is, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, just in, in sort of general society, people it's a it's a revered profession. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as as we know from you now, there's a lot of work goes into yeah. be, even being allowed to do that job. Um, is it then hard not to look down on other types of musicians? Does that I'm I'm not accusing you <laughs> of that at all, but is 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 that something that you encounter amongst classical musicians or are people just always appreciative of how people have created their types of music? I would say that classical musicians, like most other musicians, are appreciative of mm. other people. And I mean, they we all know how hard it is to be a musician, regardless of the of the genre. So yeah. I think everybody does or most people have that mutual respect there. What I will say is, is that in every single domain, there are snobs. Um, I'd say that it's an extremely small minority of people. I'd say mm. that musicians as a whole are very open people and and very um, understanding of each other's 
um, career paths and what, what work you have to yeah. put in for that. Um, yeah, but even in folk music that I have found to be probably one of the friendliest music genres by far, even though I've occasionally encountered someone who said, mm, you don't play um, your stuff by ear, that's no good for us. Yeah. Um, you know, that is, of course, a frustration for me. Um, I grew up with a completely different music tradition where I learn things by reading music. Um, and so learning things by ear is just something that I haven't trained up and I'd like to train up and I'd like to be able to do and I'd like to be able to pick up tunes like that at a drop of a hat in a session like everybody else does. I mean, well, that's... Well, maybe we should swap because <laughs> I'd like to be able to sight read like you can. <laughs> well, well, that's the thing, you know, in a session... Yeah. Um, I, I use the Tune Pal app, which yeah. I love. Um, if I don't know a tune, I put my phone on the table. It says, with 90% certainty, we think it's <laughs> it's Molly Malone or whatever. Yeah. And then and then I'll the dots will come up and I'll sight read it and I'll play it. And there'll always be people who will say, wow, my goodness, how can you read that so fast and sight read that? Oh, well, that blows my mind. And it's like, well, you blow my mind by hearing a tune not even the whole way through and you just pick it up as you go along yeah. so it's just um a question of what you've what you've been taught and how you've been trained and what you've put your time into as well exactly yeah, yeah. and what yeah. you need yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 but you do you play by the i mean that's two two distinct things playing by ear learning something by ear but playing from memory you do do that do you yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. that's a very common thing to do in classical music, especially yeah. if you're playing a solo concerto, you know, standing in front of an orchestra or playing a solo piece just on your own or with a piano or something. That is very common, yes. Mm -hmm. So I have played yeah. a lot of things from memory, but I don't learn them by ear. I learn the score yeah. and study that in detail, and then I will memorize later that, right now that sounds tricky to me because if i i can i can't sight read like you can but i can read music yeah. so if i find a piece of music or a tune in my case usually <laughs> that i i want to learn and i'm getting it from from the dots mm -hmm. um it'll just disappear straight away as soon as i've played <laughs> it it'll go in and out again and the only way i can memorize it is by, because i'm used to playing by ear by is to recording it. A, record myself yeah. playing it on the phone yeah. throw the music away and then just go and wash the dishes listening to it until i've absorbed it yeah and then try and hum it through and then from from having internalized it orally yeah then play it and then it just comes out as as i want it to so yeah. If you're working from scores and the, uh, classical music structure isn't as um, isn't as formulaic as folk tunes are, where you have mm. eight bars of that, it repeats, and then eight bars of that, yeah. it can be very free flowing and organic. So, how on earth do you memorize well, all of that stuff? Well, I mean, generally speaking, you've studied the score for a long time in order to play it very well. So does that mean? Just looking at the dots. I mean, actually practicing it on the instrument, so, you know, sort of physically learning it. So that's yeah. one thing. And of course, there will be technical passages that you've practiced a thousand times over. So, you know, they'll be, they will be there in your system. But the thing is, is that because a lot of classical music is so complex and the pieces are very, very long, you mm. can't rely on physical memory. Yeah. So if I have to memorize a complex piece of music that say it has a length of 45 minutes i'm not going to rely on my my um physical memory because something will go wrong in the context of a performance i've had that happen mm -hmm. so um you really need to also have a visual memory of the score you need the physical memory obviously you need to be able to go away without the score and be able to sing it back so maybe even sing the note names maybe even be able to write it out or play it back on the piano or on another instrument mm -hmm. there are many angles at which you can memorize it and i think that is extremely important to do for memorizing to, to use all of them or yes all of them. i mean especially yeah. if it's um a particularly if it's particularly complex rhythmically or tonally mm. then yes you really need yeah. to be able to do it from all those avenues otherwise it's just not thorough enough and then you'll get to a concert and then you'll have a memory lapse and that is one of the scariest things mm. yeah so if you're playing a 45 minute piece from memory mm -hmm. then the powers of concentration that you've 
developed must be must be huge so what advice would you give to anyone out there who's who's who playing who's learning music who plays music who wants to develop those skills how how would you advise them to improve on concentration on stage in front of an audience well it's like training up a muscle you just have to keep doing it keep training it up yeah. every day a little thing adding on adding on adding on i think it's really the only way to do it there's yeah. no there's no shortcut um, so how would you practice that? If you, because if you're on your own, mm -hmm. if you make a mistake or forget something, you can just start again. Yeah. But that's not really practicing concentration, is it? Because you, you, or is it? I don't know. Well, I would say <laughs> it actually, wouldn't be for me. Well, I would actually yeah. say that an important thing to do is to make those mistakes and make sure you recover from it and continue yeah. because yeah. that is a skill that you need to develop because those things will always happen. So it's a lot more about the recovery and how your brain deals with that and how you, you won't get un, sort of um, distracted by that and, and get out of it, of the concentration, as you like. Yeah. So that's, I guess, why we do a lot of running through of stuff in front of people and putting yourself under pressure. It's so that you know, you learn to recover from those things. And then eventually you've made so many mistakes that you won't make again because you think, ah, yeah, there's that place and I have to make sure that doesn't happen. And, oh, yes, the second time that tune comes around, there's that bar that's different. Yeah. And, so you've got yeah. a map in your head of the, the dangers. Yeah. Here be dragons <laughs> <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose that's how I do it, just on a smaller scale because... Um, mm -hmm. and, the, and the thing with uh, traditional music is um, if you have a complete memory lapse... It comes back round again in about eight bars time. So <laughs> <laughs> the only worry you have to have is not to freak yourself out about making yeah. the mistake and make it again when yeah. it comes round again. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. at least you can hook yourself back in yeah. if you're playing with other people. But playing solo, mm, that, if you yeah. drop out, then <laughs> then there's then there's silence mm. and you've you've got to deal with that. I don't know if you've done any like true solo playing with no no accompaniment. Yeah. But that's, yeah. That's, yeah. a, that's probably out, the, most, the most scary thing. <laughs> you end up improvising in the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And finding your way back in. Yeah. And, and you've also played modern classical music. Yes, a um, bit, yeah. Where I'm just assuming some of the pieces didn't even have what you would normally call a tune. Where yeah. It's, mm -hmm. yeah. So how do you memorise that stuff? Well, I mean, also I would say that kind of music, especially if it's, you know very atonal or um, includes a lot of special techniques or very specific rhythm, you really just have to take it apart. Um, I wouldn't work on a piece of contemporary classical music in the same way I would a piece by Beethoven. I just wouldn't. So you've done competitions, of course, it's part, yeah. of, the, part, part of the journey. Yeah. And, and uh, competitions exist in folk music as well, mm -hmm. but less so in other genres. How? Um, and for my, for me, my feeling competitions and also exams, having studied music as well, was always a hard thing to get my head around in something that's actually an art form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what's your take on art versus competitiveness? So I don't like competitions, um, uh, but I think they are necessary for furthering your career. That's the way I see it. I don't think competitions are necessary for becoming a better musician. Well, putting in the work yeah. on all the repertoire that you have to prepare for a competition, of course, that furthers you as a musician, but the competition in itself, I'm not sure. Um, Do you think it gives you more of an impetus to put that work in? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, so I suppose um, it does for, for you as a, as a musician on, on that level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's true. I, I know that in traditional music, uh, and I think um, in our bit of Europe anyway, it, it was the Irish that um, really first did that and, and drove up standards in traditional music playing mm -hmm. by, by having competitions and that becoming a a normal path for people mm -hmm. to follow and they're learning yeah, no, and also them, later yeah. mm -hmm. um but it was not something that i mean we have it in northumberland as well and, and i tried it and it it wasn't something i could really get into much yeah well i mean it's it's a very very different feeling to performing mm. i mean that's the thing you you're you're sort of willingly going on stage knowing that you're going to be judged yeah um, that is one of the most difficult things as a musician. At least when you go to perform for an audience, you can always think, well, I'm performing for a bunch of nice people who just want to have a nice night. 
um, that's very different to, to walking out in front of a jury and a, and a critical audience. Yeah, yeah. With, with exams at university, you know, we had a couple of times a year all throughout the course. That, that was a, a really tricky thing for me because mm-hmm. I was, I grew up performing. Yeah, it's a similar thing, you know, you're being and, marked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's, mm-hmm. that was the difference. I grew up performing and I never really struggled with stage fright or really understood what stage fright is until yeah. this being marked thing was introduced into the uh, yeah. equation. And it took me um, a long time to try and deal with it. I mm-hmm. just sort of, I did that kind of cat lying down in front of a, <laughs> a bigger cat <laughs> and, and just I just played wrong notes on purpose just to be as bad as it could be and mm-hmm. then thought right it's too late now it's gone and, I, and it took me a long time to rescue myself from that mm-hmm. self-sabotage um, but then I, th- I felt you know once I did my final recital um, I, felt I, I then had the feeling nothing can ever scare me that much again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Having Knowing that like four years of study is kind of hinging on this moment now. It's yeah. a bit like Eminem with, <laughs> you've got one, got one chance one to chance. get it right. Yeah. And, and, well, that's true. I mean, then, that's, that's the thing that's yeah. difficult for us musicians. Yeah. You know, if you've got an exam for your studies or if you've got, like me, an audition for an orchestra, you've got that one chance and you have to somehow show everything you're capable of at the best yeah. of your ability in that moment. I mean, it's like, it's like, I don't know, golf or tennis or something. It's the same kind of thing. You, you got that chance when you're there and that's it. Uh, you're in an orchestra that you have always wanted to be in. Yeah. Uh, you've been all, you've studied all over Europe. Mm-hmm. What do you think you'd like to do next? Or are you happy just to stay like that? <laughs> or, or, or is there something you'd still like to try? Um, well, what I would say was I, I would be extremely happy to stay in the orchestra that I'm in for the rest of my career. I mean, if you're in an orchestra of that level, I don't see where else you'd want to go, <laughs> at least for me. Or is there something that you would like to try parallel? Yeah, so that's that? what I was going to yeah, say. In yeah. terms of in terms of my classical career, I'm, I would be absolutely more than happy to stay where I am mm-hmm. um, because it you know, it's really a high point for me. Um, and as I said earlier, I'm kind of amazed I'm, I'm there. So yeah. just have to make sure I stay. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of other parallel stuff, I mean, there's a lot of solo repertoire that I've never had the chance to play that mm-hmm. I'd like to be able to play in some recitals. It doesn't have to be in a high f- profile place. I, I don't care. I just want to play the music for that music. I mean, there's quite a lot of, um, stuff for oboe and piano that I'd like to play and explore. I have a friend in the UK who's keen to do that. So um, I hope that at some t- some stage we, we get to present that music to a few audiences. Um, and otherwise, yeah, I mean, um, I would like to do a lot more folk music and maybe get that to work for me. Um, um, it's a challenge of finding the time to do so, but I would really like to be able to do that at some yeah. point. Yeah. Well, let's give that a shot. Yeah, let's give that. <laughs> yeah. So we'll move some microphones, and we'll be back with you for um, um, for some oboe and fiddle folk tunes because I can't play classical music. So <laughs> Melanie's going to play some folk music with me. And uh, thanks very much for a really interesting and engaging chat. And good luck. I think you're on tour in Spain next with the orchestra. Yeah, we're leaving yeah. in a few days to Spain. Yeah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. And um, uh, Melanie has a YouTube channel as well, so make sure you subscribe to that as well. And then you get to see what she's up to with oboe and piano and maybe some other stuff too. Yeah.